Of executive session, unless it's so more, 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 seconded. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. We are now out of executive session, and I would like to start the public hearing process according to the calendar. We're looking for the prime sponsor of SCR 4, and Senator Daniels. Could you please introduce your bill, and we'll open up the hearing on your bill. Thank you very much for coming before our committee. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Gary Daniels. I'm a senator for District 11, representing the towns of Amherst, Merrimack, Milford, and Wilton. I appear before you today as a prime sponsor of SCR 4, a resolution calling for an Article 5 convention to propose amendments to the Constitution of the United States that impose fiscal restraints and limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Washington is broken. Uh, our states have been stripped of their rightful decision-making authority. Debt is out of control. Regulations crush free enterprise, and our freedoms have been stolen. Whereas both parties in Congress have created this problem, it is futile to believe that Congress will indeed fix the very problems that it has created and relinquish the overreach of power that is imposed on states and the people. Unless some political force outside of Washington, D.C. intervenes, the federal government will continue to bankrupt this nation, embezzle the legitimate authority of the states, and destroy the liberty of the people. Rather than securing the blessings of liberty for future generations, Washington, D.C. is on a path that will enslave our children and grandchildren to the debts of the past. Alexander, Alexander Hamilton noted in the Federalist Papers, the national government will always be disinclined to yield up any portion of its authority. So the framers wisely equipped the states with the means of reclaiming the sovereign powers and protecting the rights of their citizens, even in the face of congressional opposition. They gave us a legitimate path to save our liberty by using our state governments to impose binding restraints on the federal government. That path is found in Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution and is commonly referred to as an Article 5 Convention or a Convention of States. Article 5 vests the states with unilateral power to convene for the purpose of proposing constitutional amendments and to control the amending process from beginning to end on all pertinent matters. If we are to reverse the fatal course on which our government has set, we must use the powers granted to us uh, here in the states under the Constitution. While Congress is authorized to propose constitutional amendments, if it pleases, it is obliged to call a special convention to propose constitutional amendments if two-thirds of all state legislators, legislatures demand that it do so. I am well aware that there are those who claim that an Article 5 convention is a threat to our liberty and constitutional rights. The real threat, however, to our constitutional rights today is not posed by an Article 5 convention, but by an out-of-control federal government exercising powers that it does not have and abusing powers that it does. Many erroneously refer to an Article 5 convention as a constitutional convention. They are not the same. There is a vast difference. Simply put, a constitutional convention is held for the purpose of writing a new constitution, while an Article 5 convention is held for the purpose of proposing amendments to our existing constitution. A constitutional convention requires unanimous consent to be called by all parties that are bound to it, whereas an Article 5 convention only requires application by two-thirds of the states. Another major difference between a constitutional convention and an Article 5 convention uh, for proposing amendments is the passage and ratification process. A new constitution must be passed and ratified as a complete document, whereas amendments are passed and ratified individually. Last but not least, Article 5 could not be any clearer in regards to the powers a convention is given. Here is the relevant portion of text from Article 5. Quote, Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments 
which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions and three-fourths thereof. It is absolutely disingenuous to claim that an Article V convention can produce an entirely new Constitution. The words, quote, for proposing amendments could not be any clearer. In fact, Article V gives a convention the same authority as Congress, the power to propose amendments. Nothing more, nothing less. For those concerned that an Article V convention will result in a runaway convention, there are two reports which I can provide to the uh, committee via email because they're multi-pages. Uh, one from the American Bar Association and the other from the Department of Justice, both concluding that an Article V convention can be limited to the topic of the applications submitted by two-thirds of the states. To conclude, if you believe that Washington is broken and you don't support an Article V convention, the only tool given to us by the Founding Fathers to reel in an out-of-control federal government, what is your solution for fixing the federal government? This is a question we need to ask ourselves, as well as all opponents of SCR4. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Thank you very much for your testimony, Senator. Um, I want to let you know it was less than five minutes. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people wish to testify on behalf of this bill. I'm Glad that you took less than five minutes. I'm asking that those who speak afterwards take less than two minutes. Do you think that would be a good idea? I, I met my time limit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> 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 Very good. Any questions of the committee? I, I do have one question. Yes, Senator Agard. Thank, uh, thank you, Senator, and I appreciate the, this bill and the spirit of what, what you're trying to do here. And, uh, I've, I've had a couple of concerns, but one of them is, uh, I think you've answered this, and I just want to clarify. This would only allow amendments after two-thirds of the states agree on a limited portion, correct? Based on the documents that, that I will be providing to you, my understanding of those is that, let, let's say that you had 34 states that submitted uh, a call for a convention to address fiscal restraint and overreach of power. Uh, and let's say 32 of those also asked for term limits. My understanding is that you could only take up those topics that were asked for by 34 states, that you would not be able to address topics that did not uh, have 34 states requesting those. And one follow-up, if I may. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So <clears throat> these amendments cannot uh, annul, say, the First Amendment or the Second Amendment or the Fifth Amendment or the Fourth Amendment. They cannot annul any amendments uh, in the process of adding these. <coughs> is that correct? The, the bill that I'm putting in is very focused uh, on fiscal restraint um, and limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. So it doesn't. It doesn't call for addressing, you know, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, or any other in there. So I'm, I'm very focused on uh, what we're asking for here. And that differs from some of the other requests that have been put in by other states. Thank you. Senator Clark, for a question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for taking my question. I have two. I wanted to ask you how many states have already passed this language and you have provided it to us today, and what are those states? Uh, those, those states are Georgia, Florida, Alaska, and Alabama. And second question yes. is once um, this uh, convention is called into existence if it were to receive the necessary state support, state's support, uh, would it be able to be opened up to address other issues? That, that was a question that uh, Senator Ravard had just uh, asked, and my belief is that it, it does not. Based upon the opinions that I have received from the Bar Association and, and the Justice, um, that they can only address the topics in which are called for by, by two-thirds 
of the states. So if you had a separate issue, and I guess a good one would be Citizens United, it would have to gather the support of 34 states to be taken up. Thank you. Very good. Senator Bradley, do you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Senator Daniels. Just um, to make sure I understand the process of the Senate, and because it's a concurrent resolution, the House passed this. That is the language necessary to put New Hampshire on record being the fifth state. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Senator Susie. Thank you, Chairman. Senator Daniels. If 34 states do adopt this resolution, what would New Hampshire's process be for determining who the delegates would be to serve? My understanding is that's up to the states. Um, there have been some suggestions that, uh, well, first of all, I don't think there's any limit of number of delegates that you send to this. However, at the convention, the state will only have one vote. So I guess the, the legislature could put something together. I've seen where other states basically put it out to the people. Um, my recommendation would be have a, uh, a uh, delegation of both legislators and private sector people so that we get uh, not just the legislative part of it, but the, the real world experience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any senators or representatives who wish to speak on behalf of SCR4? Yes, please come forward. I'm yeah. against the Are you a representative or a yes. senator? Yeah, of course. Come on. Of course. Thank you very much for coming before our committee. Thank you. I wish this was a nice little parrot bill again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we just, I'm against the bill. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm Representative Janine Nodder, Hillsborough 21. I put in a bill last year to actually rescind previous calls for a convention. So we just heard that Washington's broken, so the answer is to have an Article 5 convention, but Congress is going to be the ones to call the convention, and we're going to trust them with this, huh? Think about it. If we had this convention, it was going to be the biggest media event. Every lobbyist from coast to coast is going to descend upon this convention, and you really believe that they're not going to have any sway over the delegates? Delegates that we don't know who they are, who they're going to be. There's no rules in place. There's where it's going to be held, and most importantly, who's going to pay for it. And I could go on and on and on, but I know you have uh, there's speakers here that are much more eloquent than I am. Um, Phyllis Schlafly, I'm pretty sure you've heard of her of the Eagle Forum. Uh, I have a notes from her, and uh, well, she's a, she's a brilliant woman in, in my opinion, and 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 she is also very very leery of an Article Five convention. So I would ask you, even though I love my senator and I voted for him, I do not agree with him on this, and I hope you will kill his bill. And Thank if my parent much. were here, she would say, I T L. Thank you very much for your testimony. And we'll go on. Any other senator or representative? Wish to speak, please come forward. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Prescott and the rest of the senators. <laughs> Some of them I don't know. Uh, for allowing me to testify just briefly, I don't mean to take a lot of time because, uh, and I don't mean to leave this to some other people. I think there are a number of people behind me and I would like to give some time to them, but I'll give you a couple, I, I mean, a little bit of literature here that actually, um, given from the source of our founders all the way up to, to Warren uh, Berger, are telling us about inherent dangers and some very serious inherent dangers. So I have those here and I'll give them to, the, to you all. Oh. I'm sorry, my name is Paul Ingbretson, Representative Paul Ingbretson from Grafton 15. I represent, I think, seven towns now. It used to be Thank three, you. four. Um, uh, so uh, um, this, I guess, I, there, this, to me, this actually comes under, say, three categories. One of if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it till it is. The classic uh, uh, dictum in government is if it ain't broke, fix it till it is. We have a problem in, in the government, but it's us. And, I, and it's our electorate as well, but the Constitution isn't broke. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. We have an incredible number of, of enumerated powers that are being completely overrun, and we've been part of it. Title I, just education, Title I, and all the money that's being spent in Title I. So fiscal restraint, you know, I, we've already got it built in, and we just ignore it by buying in to the federal money. So that's a, that's a kind of a key thing. Uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good. We have probably the most astounding country in the world, and we would put it at risk because of some money, possibly, that we could, if we would just act as states, in response, by the way, to your question, 
if we just ask, act as states together and nullify some of these federal laws, like tell them to take a hike, but we want that money so bad, and that's us. It's not about the federal uh, constitution. Um, actually, one of the, uh, several of the, uh, 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 those people pushing, including Mark uh, Levin, actually, when you read their, their amendments, they actually are enshrining a whole bunch of this kind of spending, just so you know. Have a good look at them. I really please the committee, if, you, if you're going to vote yes on this, please look at all these warnings first and all the things being proposed. I have another uh, class of, uh, of uh, cliches, what could go wrong. I like the Murphy's one, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, there is absolutely no, <laughs> no guarantee. The first document I give you at the top of this thing is that Congress's powers over this stuff, even the con Congress's powers once they've adopted this are absolutely limited according to all sorts of justices. Uh, I should say, to two different Supreme Court justices. And, and by the way, the body, if you look at it, the body of, uh, of uh, uh, law is in opposition to this. I mean, not in opposition, but in agreement with me that the dangers are incredible. And not just the list, I mean, a runaway convention, a new constitution, potentially uh, enshrining the present abuses by the feds. Uh, in the category of what could go wrong, I love the idea of who the players could be. You know, this becomes an influence. Some of the founders talk about the influence that would probably come to bear, I believe Madison's especially. And um, I just look at what's happening today. We're looking at the Koch brothers and George Soros, and I'm thinking, that's nobody that would be our enemy, right? It's a major elitist in this country who just love the individual liberties we have, right? So one of them has already been participating in creating a Marxist constitution to replace, and they want to replace it by 2020, that organization does. <laughs> and, uh, and the Rockefeller brothers have already created their own new America constitution, which turns us into regions and takes away this state. So, you know, on top of it all, if we managed to do anything that did become a runaway, we'd wind up with absolute chaos in this country. We'd wind up with hell, whether, and, and <laughs> especially if it changed it significantly. And I know there's rationale of disarming people if you think that's the first thing you've got to do before hell breaks loose, but I suggest we really consider that this is more, far more hazardous, potentially, than, than any good that could possibly come out of it. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. And I'll give this to you. Any other representatives or senator wish to speak on behalf of the bill? I'm going to start with the top of the list, and I would uh, like that if you would uh, hold your testimony to the pertinent things that the committee hasn't even heard yet. Now, we've, we've heard a bunch of uh, good information from the prime sponsor and now two that dissent. If you keep your uh, testimony to new and relevant information, that would assist us in, in moving on to six more bills. And the first one I'm going to call upon is Mark Meckler. Thank you very much for coming before our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mark Meckler. That's spelled M-E-C-K-L-E-R. I'm the president of Citizens for Self-Governance, also the president of Convention of States Action, which is the sponsoring entity for the Convention of States Project nationally. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before this esteemed committee. I'd like to set forth a little bit of history. I think uh, everybody who's testified has talked about the dangers of a runaway federal government. Federal government's out of control fiscally and in regulatory manners, overreaching state authority has been for many, many decades. And we've seen no reversal of that, regardless of which party controls Washington, D.C., or even the White House. So I think the, the common thread among people who agree that we should do this or not agree is that something must be done to rein in a runaway Washington, D.C. The founders told us exactly what to do. On September 15th in 1787, two days before the end of the convention, Colonel George Mason from Virginia stood and addressed the assembly. And he informed the gentlemen present that they had a fundamental flaw in the Constitution. They had given the right to amend to the Congress itself, but not to the people acting through the states. And Mason asked the assembled men if they were so naive that they believed that a government that became a tyranny would propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny. And I imagine if I could have been there, they probably would have all laughed, and I, we would have listened to them laugh. We know that's impossible. Tyrannies never restrain themselves. Governments that grow their powers never reduce their own powers. And so Mason proposed that the states, the people acting through the states, have the power to exercise this authority over the federal government. Madison's notes, interestingly, reflect no debate. In a convention where everything was debated vigorously, there was no debate. Madison's portion of notes on this portion of the convention, literally a half a page, a paragraph, and unanimously adopted was the power given, frankly, to you, members of the state legislature, to control the federal government should it run out of control. I believe it's a sacred obligation passed to you essentially in a bottle or on a piece of parchment over the centuries 
and they reached out to you as the fundamental last line of defense for liberty. The question we have to ask ourselves today is, are we any longer a constitutional republic? Are we truly a representative republic? Or does the president and Congress and, frankly, the Supreme Court do whatever they want with disregard for the American people? I could tell you definitively what the American people believe. 72% of the American people, regardless of party, say that the federal government is too big and does too much. That's not to say government at large. They don't have the same opinion about their state governments. Whatever side of the aisle they're on, whatever their political ideology, they just don't like the idea of the decisions being made for them in Washington, D.C. They trust you. I trust you. We trust you. The American people trust you. And they want the power taken away from the federal government and given back to you at the state level. We can have the debates at the state level about policy, about what should be done and not done, what should be spent and not spent. But right now, those debates are being had in Washington, D.C., far away from the public whom they by and large affect. Now, you're going to hear the opponents of this talk about the dangers of a runaway convention. First, I would posit we are experiencing the dangers of a runaway government in Washington, D.C. right now. Anything that this convention could propose can be proposed by Congress today with unfettered authority. There is no difference. And the idea of a runaway convention is, is simply, quite frankly, absurd. They will quote authorities that are 20, 30 years old. They will quote Chief Justice Warren Berger, who was a very activist justice who liked the idea of a runaway federal government. They'll quote him in defense of the Constitution. Frankly, it's outrageous. Let me just run through quickly the process for you. You had a couple of questions, Senator, which I thought were great questions. Let me succinctly give you the process and exactly how it works. Once 34 states have called according to a limited application, and this application is very limited in what can be discussed, the convention convenes. The only discussions that can take place at convention are those covered by the law of convention, which is the application you and 33 other states pass. Anything else discussed is automatically out of order, and according to the parliamentary procedure upon you, which you operate every day, any delegate, your delegate, can raise their hand if anything's out of order and outside of those parameters and object. And according to parliamentary procedure, that discussion would be shut down. And if you presume that none of the delegates are going to pay attention to the rules, you could presume that. I assume you're going to send good delegates, and many states are. Let's presume they all decide they're not going to follow any of the rules. You still have to get 26 states together to pass anything out of convention. So you have to presume 26 states in total are going to agree to throw the rules of convention out, to ignore their state legislatures, and to pass something out of that convention that doesn't fall within the application. And then if you believe in the runaway, you have to believe that that's going to go out to the states and that 38 states in total are going to ratify something that had nothing to do with the rules of that convention. That all the state legislatures, you're talking the vast majority, 38 state legislatures, are going to ignore the will of their people, the will of their legislatures. They're going to ignore that the convention went wrong, and they're going to ratify it. And let's flip that math on its head, because I think this is the simplest and most eloquent answer against the idea of a runaway convention. It takes only 13 states to stop anything that comes out of convention that we don't like. And to be plain and simple about that, there are 13 states on either side of the ideological spectrum that can stop anything that they thought was crazy and radical. The only thing that will come out of this convention are things that the American people, by and large, already support. That's what a convention is for. So for example, Americans want the federal government to balance its budget. They want the federal government to get its fiscal house in order. That can and will come out. So that's, those are the arguments for the convention, the idea that it could run away. There's no historical precedent for it. And frankly, there's no legal authority for it. Thank you very much for your testimony. Question of yes. Senator Avard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions, yes, if sir. I may. Uh, the first one is, uh, who determines who is the delegates? Is it, is it both governor? Is it the House and the Senate? Is it, is it the governor? Is it the executive council? It's the leg your legislature. House and Senate will decide who the delegates are from your state. And in true federalist fashion, each state will do it differently. Some states, by the way, are passing legislature, companion legislature, deciding how they will choose their delegates. And follow-up question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so if we decided not to go with this and the other states go with this, uh, are we left out of the party? No, absolutely not. The states that don't apply, once the convention is called, I expect all 50 states will want to attend and have their say at the convention. And then that begs one final question. Sure. So, uh, then, that being the case, that, then does that uh, generate uh, a whole host of other issues being brought forward, or is the convention exclusive to those that were originally brought forward? Meaning, the, the right amount of numbers of right. states voted for five different topics. Right. And the other states didn't participate. Too bad. This is the topic. 
That's correct. The, the law of convention will still be determined according to the states that have applied and qualified the convention for a sitting convention. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All set. Thank you so much for Thank your you, testimony Senator. and Thank your time. You. Uh, Bill McNally, again, I, I would like to stress upon new information before the committee would be appreciated. It's some brand new information. I'm Bill McNally from Windham, New Hampshire. I'm opposing this bill. In 1978, the United States Congress passed Public Law 97435, which says that beginning in fiscal year 1981, Congress shall balance the budget. Or they <coughs> use words like receipts shall not uh, exceed uh, the spending. So I could email that to you. I didn't happen to bring that with me. In 19... Um, 88. I'm testifying before the late Senator Eleanor Pottles, and she says to me, Bill, do you have anything to add that no one has added to the committee? And I says, yes, I do, which I'll add here. Same thing being true back then. I said, are you aware that the uh, legislator of New Hampshire may not get to approve anything that goes on in these uh, constitutional convention, maybe Congress will decide to put it to a, com uh, a convention, another committee to decide on it, which, who are they? It's not going to be you people, possibly. So, I, I, she said, she was really taken aback and she says, Bill, can I ask one of those lawyers that are down here from Washington on the opposite side of you? I said, go ahead. So she pointed to this lawyer and she said, would you stand up? He says, you heard what Mr. McNally says. Is, is he right or, or, or what? He says, basically he's correct, and he sat down. Now, so just for enjoyment here, I have a letter here from the union leader, 1988. President of the United States calls the New Hampshire legislature and dictates action. It was, I was there when it happened, so I know. So I'm gonna leave this. I know you're gonna wanna read this because it's really great. And I'm going to leave you yeah, yeah. With these audio CDs, they're 35 minutes. I've got one for each senator. And they're going to answer the questions that these people that are testifying have either misanswered or misstrewed or whatever. So we won't go into that rebuttal. It's all right here. I thank you very much. I hope you will oppose this. Thank you very much. Thank you, testimony. Joseph Modela. Joseph Modela, and then uh, right after that is uh, John Terriel, or Terralt. Thank you, Joseph, for coming before our committee. Thank you for holding the meeting. Uh, I'm Joseph Modela, I live at 4530 Street, Manchester. I'm a retired military conservative gardener and photographer. I like to stay abreast of local issues, and I hope to keep America, America, and not uh, have it devolve into a socialist cesspool. Anyways, uh, there are a number of issues that Congress refuses to act on, and some of them are really egregious. When they passed the asset forfeiture law back about 40 years ago, we had been promised that it was only going to be used on drug kingpins the guys with the lead jets and bringing in bales of marijuana, et cetera, et cetera. And now, of course, it's being used on anybody and everybody. Uh, somebody picks up a working lady and they get their car stolen. In Las Vegas, a woman in her 50s had one illegal plant growing in her backyard for her arthritis. The police raided and she was arrested. The county prosecutor exclaims, she owns a house, doesn't she? His first thought was policing for profit. Luckily, the neighbors protested and stopped the seizure. We need to reform the asset forfeiture laws. It goes against private property and being secure in your papers. And it's fundamentally wrong. I get a whole bunch of things. But I, I don't want to use up my two minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for your testimony. Uh, one question. If Senator Avard. I didn't gather whether you're for or against this. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm for it. Thank you. We need to reform this 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, you're talking about your opposition to the forfeiture law, but as I see it, there's nothing um, in the bill that's calling for a physical restraint that actually would make it possible for that to happen under this call. Uh, that, that's true, but at the convention, I believe they can add amendments, and that could be one of them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that could be added during the convention. Follow up? Certainly. I believe other people have testified that they would not be able to add additional items. So mm -hmm. um, we're you know, hearing two different uh, messages here. Oh, okay. Well, I, I refer to the Mark Levin book, the amendments. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, John, Terrell, thanks. And right after that is uh, Larry Jones. I'll be very short, sir. My name is John Thuriel. I live at 76 Bradford Road, Keene, New Hampshire. I'm the state director for Convention of States. Uh, and as such, it's been uh, my honor over the last year and a half to uh, gather grassroots support within New Hampshire for SCR4 in support of SCR4. I, I have uh, right now 223 uh, sign petitions uh, for this committee that is they're in each of your uh, your districts mm -hmm. within the entire state of New Hampshire in this box I have 1500 signed petitions from New Hampshire voters supporting SCR4 and asking this committee to unanimously vote yes uh, in order to uh, re uh, reduce the scope and power of the federal government and impose fiscal constraints Good testimony. Thank you very much for coming before our committee. If you could state your name for the record, we'd appreciate that. My name is uh, Larry Jones. I'm from Peterborough, New Hampshire. Mr. Chairman and committee members, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. All wisdom, all knowledge, and all truth resides with the federal government, right? If you believe that, then you probably are part of the federal government. <laughs> I am deeply disturbed by the thought that all wisdom, knowledge, and truth resides there because it seems to me like the federal government's just kind of lost its way. It it's now seems to think it's supposed to do everything. Now, if you look in the Constitution in Article 1, you'll see that it clearly states that the federal government has clearly enumerated authority to act on certain things. And it appears to me that they forgot that part of the Constitution and they forgot the, the constraints that are set forth upon the federal government, the legislature, the executive branch, and the judiciary. Now there's some evidence for this, and it's been previously mentioned by some of the other speakers. One of the, the paramount concerns I have is the 19 trillion dollar debt that the federal government has accrued. Now this is the greatest demonstration of fiscal irresponsibility and immorality that I can ever think of. I mean, this is a burden that's being cast upon future generations and have no say. It's in essence spending without representation. And in my view, it's evil, let alone immoral. Additionally, that $19 trillion is just the tip of the iceberg because many experts believe that the unfunded liabilities of the federal government exceed $200 trillion, depending on who you speak to. Is this the kind of federal government we want to have freely unrestrained by the states? I mean, we have a contract between the federal government and the states. And that contract is the Constitution. And thus far, it seems to me that the federal government is acting totally irresponsibly. It has been Additionally, the federal government, I, I know there are concerns about a runaway convention of the states wherein all kinds of weird things are going to happen, but we already have weird things happening in Washington, D.C., where they, they are 
engaging in a de facto amending of the Constitution. And an example of that is Article 1 says that only Congress shall legislate. But that's not the case anymore. No, we have legions of unelected, unaccountable, and oftentimes arrogant bureaucrats and that, who with in three minutes, euphemistic sleight of hand legislate laws and call them rules and regulations. Once again, an example of legislation, or not once again actually, but this is legislation without representation. Inflicting. And, uh, just to let you know, it's been three and a half minutes of your testimony. And for those that might speak after you, maybe they might say something. Have I already got three and a half minutes? Yes, I know. For the, well, I, uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, let me just conclude sure. by saying, no. without going for another three and a half minutes, I would strongly encourage you to exercise your authority as a state legislature to call for convention of the states to do what we can to amend the Constitution to put greater restraints on the federal government. It's your duty, it's your responsibility, not only to the residents of New Hampshire today, but future residents. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. I appreciate your testimony. Good. Representative Baldassaro. Representative Baldassaro, yes. there he is. Good afternoon. Yep. Good afternoon. I try to get here early. I was in committee for the record. Representative Al Baldassau, Rockingham County, um, District 5, which is Londonderry. I've uh, been fortunate to sit on the state and federal relations for the last nine years, going on my 10th year. This bill has come to me many times. I supported a bill a few years ago when I was a chairman to balance uh, for a constitution amendment to balance the budget. After I uh, supported that, and I think it passed the Senate, went on to Washington, I really started looking into it a lot more. And what got me a little nervous because of a few years ago here, and I think it was 1970 out here in New Hampshire, we had a Constitution Convention. Article 73A, there was a section that was changed, and nobody can say how that got changed during a uh, Constitution Convention. And what that, the only line that was really messed up was, the rules so promulgated shall have the force and effect of law for the Supreme Court. There's another section in New Hampshire Constitution that says the legislative power belongs within the House and the Senate of equal power. I really thought about this and I tried to find in Jeffsonian papers and other areas rules of a convention. And I came across on the Maryland um, delegates that walked away because of what was going on. I seen that there were secret ballots that went on. I seen that they would Maryland could not replace their people. I seen that rules were made for those individuals, but they didn't comply with them because they were in other states. So this got me nervous. Do I really want to support a constitutional convention and opening up the Constitution and they pull the same thing that was done in the 1700s? That's why I oppose this here. And I'm hoping we really think, until we come up with some type of rules, okay, um, in place, that will not only be done in New Hampshire, but will be respected in another state, or in the Washington, D.C., which is supposed to be neutral, wherever they have it. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Abar, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony, uh, Representative. Uh, I, I gather that you're not for this bill. Right. If, and. One of the questions that, that, that's really bugging me is that even if we pass this, what's the guarantee that the feds are going to listen anyway? And, 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 and meaning, if we pass this and we, we, we pass this Constitution and they add an, another amendment, the feds aren't listening anyway. Uh, so I, I don't know if you have an answer for that. I do have an answer. Because after I did the balanced budget, which I was oh, so highly in agreement, then I looked at, they can't even comply with other laws that they put in place on budgeting. You know what I mean? And the same thing with the president right now. How many budgets have they put forward in the last seven years? So for us to even take a gamble on our constitutional rights, you know, I've taken the oath to defend and support and protect the Constitution for many years I did in the Marine Corps and then five terms here as a rep. 
Every cold day in hell, I'd be willing to take a chance of losing one bit of my freedom to a constitutional convention. Thank you very much for your testimony. May I remind the public that we're talking about proposed amendments to the Constitution, not a constitutional convention, so that we could stay on track with your testimony. Mr. This Chairman, is a name, Senate concurrent resolution. I did four and three. I'm going to take my name off instead of speaking on both. That's why I went that okay. for both of them, so I don't have to tie up your committee. Okay, thank you very much. The next person on the list is uh, Mark Abar, or Abair, sorry. <clears throat> thank you for coming before our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand that the, uh, the committee will take a written testimony, and I'd forego the opportunity to speak if you'll take my testimony. I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is he uh, I am and you are signed up as support of the bill. That is correct. And Larry Hennessy, you wish to speak in support of the bill? Thank you very much for coming before us today. Thank you very much for hearing me. Uh, my name is Lawrence Hennessy, Jr. from Franklin, New Hampshire. Uh, I can shorten it by calling me Larry. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, I served our country in the U.S. Navy. I did a tour in uh, the Gulf. And um, I have not been involved in politics, but now I am being thrust into um, doing something because what's going on right now if you're if you're in a bag you may not see what's going on but our country is broken it is broken and your fear sir of the federal government it's it's not the way it was supposed to be the federal government had to beg the states at first for a national defense that was the original intent of the Constitution. It's the United States of America, not the federal government of America. Do not give in to fear, please. Do not give in to fear. We, the people, are going to take this country back one way or the other. It's going to happen because when you rob people of their freedoms, when tyranny goes unchecked, people rebel. I urge you just to keep an open mind and keep this going to see where it leads. Do not, do not submit to the fear. Thank you very much. Because doing nothing is worse than doing something in this case. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for your question. In addition to uh, running a committee, I'm also in charge of decorum. Please uh, keep the decorum. Thank you. Uh, Mike Stan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is um, Michael Stan. I live in Hampton Falls, New Hampshire. <clears throat> uh, I'm in support of the bill. And I'm a private citizen. And I believe the most efficient government is local government. Uh, I don't feel that those uh, that we've sent to Washington really have are in touch with what the states need or the people of the states need. Um, I'm going to keep this short. I'm not afraid of a runaway convention, as others have stated. Uh, I'm not afraid of lobbyists at the convention trying to make a runaway convention. It can't be any worse than what we have right now. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much. The next person who wishes to speak is Glenn Donovan. Thank you so much for coming before our committee. Thank you for having me. My name is Glenn Donovan. I live in Nelson. Um, I come before you today to speak in favor of SCR 4. I have one page of prepared remarks, which go directly to the questions that have been raised by Senator Prescott and Senator Clark. Uh, it's a little bit of a, more of an esoteric technical point, so bear with me. Critics, critics of an Article uh, 5 Amendment Convention use tactics of fear and misinformation to discourage supporters. They raise hypothetical questions that those uninformed on the topic are not able to respond to. One such question they raise is, what will happen if the delegates to the amendment convention do not follow their instructions? What will happen if they introduce topics foreign to the purpose of the amendment convention and, God forbid, end up destroying the Constitution as we know it? Such arguments, in addition to ignoring the long-standing history of conventions in this country, also ignore <coughs> well-established principles embedded in agency law. Agency law refers to the relationship between a person or agent that acts on behalf of another. An agency relationship is generated by the consent of both the agent and the principal. The courts recognize three different types of agency relationships, universal, general, and special. 
An agent functioning with a special agency can only function according to the specific instructions given to the principal. Agency relationships carry with them specific duties, including, among others, duty to obey the principal's instructions, duty to act with skill and reasonable scale, uh, care, duty to keep the principal informed about the agent's actions, duty of loyalty to the principal and to act in the best interest of the principal, duty of good faith when dealing with the principal. Courts recognize that if an agent fails to perform any of these duties, the principal may be able to win a tort case for breach of duty. So there is recourse. As such, generally, a principal can end an agency relationship at any time and for nearly any reason. Many critics of Article 5, uh, of an Article 5 effort, try to raise a fear that once we send delegates uh, to an amendment convention, that they will ignore their agencies and somehow act irrationally and destroy our Constitution. That fact is, we are, uh, excuse me, the fact is, we are faced with a real and present danger. Rather than fret about the possibility of a runaway convention, we can turn to the more substantive work of reining in a real runaway federal government. I urge unanimous approval of SCR 4. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Jean Shannon, thank you so much for coming before our committee. The next person who wishes to speak is Ken Quinn. Thank you, Jean. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to this committee. Uh, I believe that an Article 5 convention would almost certainly turn into a runaway convention. Uh, back in the 70s, the House Judiciary Committee uh, convinced the Congress that it lacked power to limit the Constitution under Article 5 and therefore refused to let the bill go forward. Our Constitution has survived well over 200 years and it has served us well. A runaway convention would be a disaster and create more problems than it would solve. We do not need talking heads such as Mark Levin and others whose objective is to sell books telling us how to vote. I would hope that the New Hampshire House and Senate would look at itself as to whether or not our state is living up to the state's responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. <clears throat> Ken Quinn. Thank you for coming before our committee. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Distinguished members of the committee, thank you. My name is Ken Quinn. I'm from, uh, my address is 5 Sunset Avenue, Lisbon Falls, Maine. I'm the regional director for the Convention of States Project. Uh, a couple years ago, I too, like many of the folks in this room, was afraid of an Article 5 convention. In fact, I used to give my legislators a uh, DVD called Beware of Article 5, and I used to try to rescind these applications. Funny thing happened, I, st I went to the original source of where Article 5 came from, and I learned a real good lesson. I always take the words of the people who did the decision making. Came to find out the reason why Article 5, uh, the convention bill, was placed into the Constitution was because the framers knew what they were creating was not perfect. They also knew that the government they just created one day could and probably would get out of control. Their wisdom was tremendous. And they immediately voted on adding a convention of the states to protect the Constitution and the Republic. Now I'd like to ask a rhetorical question. How many amendments, do you, do you know how many amendments Congress has introduced uh, since 1789? over 11,600. Out of that, only 33 passed Congress by the two-thirds needed, and 27 of those were ratified. I, the reason we have a Constitution today is because of the amending process. If we didn't have the amending process, we still, we probably would not have a country today. That is what's so powerful about this. Article 5 is the, the healing balm to our Constitution. And we're at a point now where the federal government has become the, the, the monster they were afraid of. We are not looking to, I want to like to answer your question about they don't obey it now. Well, amendments really do work. Our, we have a long history that amendments are enforced, they are obeyed, and we wouldn't have our country if it wasn't for the amending process. Now the only ones we see a lot of pushback, guess what, are the ones that limit the federal government. However, 
those were proposed when the federal government was less than one year old. It was a little baby at that time. That little baby has now become a Godzilla. And it's time we have amendments to address the, the power of that federal government. And what we're looking to do is not to give them more authority and more things to obey. We want to take that away from them because we believe you as state legislators should be the ones making most of these decisions. James Madison himself said we had two, two minutes. Thank you. We had two constitutions. One, the enumerated constitution, which we, all of us in this room love. And that's what we're fighting for. But he also said we have another one, the one that gets expanded by the interpretation. And we're seeing that being done by the Supreme Court and the federal government. And all we are asking for is just a meeting of the states to discuss it and come up with some good ideas and then let the states decide through the ratification process. So I thank you. I ask you to support SCR4, and I just thank you for your time. Thank you very, very much. And I'd like to submit this information uh, as well. All right. Uh, the next person who wishes to speak is uh, Norma. Norma Tregenza? Are you here? Norman? Oh, sorry. Okay. Mr. Former, N. Former representative, Honorable. Okay. And I was told that you're a former representative. I did serve a term, yes. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is. It's Tregenza, T R E G E N Z A. And I came down from Carroll County this morning. <clears throat> this entire attempt for a conference of the states, uh, many conjecture that as a result of that, we will achieve a balanced budget. Okay? Get the balanced budget into the Constitution, everybody will obey it. Problem with that is, we have a Constitution, we don't obey the Constitution now. When's the last time Congress declared war? 1940s. But we've been involved in many wars since then. Uh, the Constitution states that the government shall coin money, but yet we print money today, and it has no backing, it has no, no value, no in, in, intrinsic value. So, um, we're, we're trying to solve a problem uh, n not really the right way. Mrs. Fuller-Clark uh, asked the question, who will select the delegates? We don't know. You know, will it be the legislature? Will it be uh, the introducer of the bill had suggested that it could be a combination of the legislature and, uh, and an informed citizenry? But we don't know who's going to choose these delegates. We don't know how knowledgeable these delegates are going to be about the Constitution that are chosen. Um, furthermore, this depends on the good faith of other, other political bodies. Um, I'll just say, and this is just one example, uh, the legislature in this state in 1962 or 3 uh, passed a temporary rooms and meals tax bill. Well, at 2 or 3 percent, and it's only gone up and up and up. There was no temporary about it. But yet, it had the good, there, there was the belief that it would be temporary, yet, yet that has not been the case. And, and there are so many other cases like that. Two minutes. Sure. I would just ask that the, the, lastly, the gentleman behind me, Mr. Meckler, stated the word when he described a runaway convention, I believe the word he, he used was the possibility was absurd, yet our very own founding fathers were called in May of 1787 to amend the Articles of Confederation. And what they did was they abolished them. So, so it is not absurd. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Now, I have gone through the list, and I found that I uh, think that I've called on everyone that was wanting to come right forward. If you are a representative or a senator, oh, would you like I'm to speak? I'm a tax-paying citizen. My name's Russ Payne from Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm opposed to 
SCR right. 4. Good. Thank you. And uh, I'll try to keep it as short as I can. I oppose SCR 3 and 4, observing speaking out against the Constitutional Convention. For I've been doing that for 40 years. Uh, and they have resembled the food industry's introduction of new cake mixes each year. Uh, they've given us, you know, first we had white chocolate, angel food, and yellow cake mix. Now we've got all, unlimited varieties. And so growing, and so all of these cake mixes have icing on them. Icing on the outside and toxic sugar inside. Okay, speaking of cake, this 4th of July, 240th anniversary of the United States, American taxpayers are going to be presented with an $18 trillion birthday cake. Do you think they ask us when they spent all that money what they were going to do, what they were going to do with it? No. Do you think they ask our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, are going to be paying installments on it? No. Uh, so, uh, addressing some of the concerns of before, uh, we all have the same concerns, runaway federal government. I have a concern of runaway convention. Okay, but we have a con con, it's a bad idea because the states will have very little control of, of this convention after they ratify, after you get 32 or 34 states. Uh, in 1984, after the, uh, the cons after con con calls were made in 32 or 34 states needed, the United States Judiciary Committee warned the states, and I paraphrase, it is the Congress's responsibility to call the convention, their authority to determine the constitutional preconditions and possesses the they possess the authority to set forth necessary and attendant details to the convention. Reference Senate 119 of that year. Okay, uh, getting back. Okay, but my purpose here is mainly to expose the tragic flaw in the con, -con solution to rein in the federal government's abuse of power, targeting symptoms while ignoring the source, which is addiction to unconstitutional spending by the federal Congress. Taking the Constitutional Convention aspirin remedy for the $18 trillion appendicitis cake might numb the pain of the taxpayer, but if the source of the pain is ignored and not removed through the ballot box or state nullification surgery, treating the symptom will kill us and our nation. Okay, uh, I am Three against minutes. this, and uh, I urge you to vote against this bill. All right. Thank you very much for yes, your sir. testimony. Now, I would that anybody else wishes to speak, please come forward and be mindful of our time that we need to uh, move forward the next. My name is Hal Shirtliff. Good I am the uh, a field rep for the John Burke Society, but I also uh, am the founder, a co-founder and director of Camp Constitution, which is New Hampshire based. Um, I'm going to cut a lot of things I was going to say because it's already been addressed, but one of the um, notions is that a convention, that the rules will be drawn up uh, there'll be agreements made and so forth. Well, there are no rules and no laws currently. We are told by supporters of an Article 5, however, that uh, Congress has no say in the matter. But I, uh, let me concur. I want to show you some proof. And by the way, they use the term constitutional convention when they describe an Article 5. This is 1979. I'll be happy to give the committee a copy of this. Uh, we put it back in print after many years. This was a committee held by Orrin Hatch, who was sympathetic to an Article 5, and there are a lot of people in here pro and con. In fact, that's where the term runaway came from. The, some of the uh, legal scholars said, bar the door. But they believe, under the necessary and proper clause, that they can indeed have control of it. We talked about the delegates. How will you appoint delegates? We don't know how it will be done. Will they be elected? Will they, in the, if they're elected, will, will they have lobbyists? Will they be getting money from special interest groups? And will they be binded to special interest groups? Now, state conventions, usually have state reps and state senators that represent, that, that, are, that appear at these events. What's stopping members of Congress from being delegates at this convention? This is, they're, they're, the, they're the problem, yet they may be sitting in this convention. And you, as state legislators, you once, if you do pass these, I'm here, I'm here to 
of both S S uh, SCR three and four. Um, once the uh, once you submit a resolution, uh, you may never do anything again because under Article five, Congress can put set up ratifying committees. So you may never see it. You may never hear it again. And uh, I think it was the 18th Amendment, to, to repeal the 18th Amendment, the 21st Amendment, they had ratifying committees. So there's a chance that you think you're going to have some say over any amendments and any of these bad amendments or crazy amendments that may come out of, the, uh, out of this convention. And by the way, what's a crazy amendment? That's a subjective term, isn't it? I mean, there are some of us would like, oh, okay, all right. Well, I just want to conclude. There's a statue of Daniel Webster in the front of the building here. And uh, this is what he said. He said, hold fast, my friends, to the Constitution and to the republic for which it stands. Miracles do not cluster, and what happened uh, once in 5,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. So thank you. Yes, and thank you. you. Again, anyone else wish to speak? Seeing no one.